I'm just going to stretch since I, I, I'm kind of bored now. Okay, anyway, so let me manually do. Did you like that picture? Oh, that's a nice picture, right? Okay. Yeah, okay, cool. So, so I am a colorectal surgeon as that little snippet included. And it also included a brief intro to me as someone who is a medical director and the owner of a medical spa. So I, I know you're, and, and I'll get to the point here in just a minute, stay with me. Um, I know you're wondering, how does a colorectal surgeon own a med spa? Because those two things don't really sound congruent. So patients just come in and flip a coin, heads or tails, like which one is that going to come up? It depends. So, uh, and I will tell you how I came to the conclusion that we, I was going to open this business. Um, in my specialty, and you guys don't actually get to see what we do in clinic, you only see what we do in the operating room. So in my specialty, a lot of what I do is prepped in the office first. It's, I'm not, I don't do ER calls and emergency stuff. I do a lot of elective surgery on the intestinal tract and oh my god can people stop bothering me that's my husband <laughs> try to try to ignore that i have it on do not disturb too that's so annoying anyway so um anyway so um because i discuss a lot about nutrition oh heavens to mercy really how does how does one make that stop all right uh hmm uh can okay i don't i on do not disturb i don't know sorry y'all you're gonna hear dings every time you hear a bell ring an angel gets its wings okay so <laughs> that's <laughs> whatever so all right anyways so i talk nutrition all day long with these patients because most of what brings my patients to the operating room are going to be a lifelong of bad habits and nutrition another bell, um, and bad nutrition ruins the GI tract. And so I'm talking nutrition all day long to prevent operations. And my patients who are trying to heal from surgery, I talk nutrition all day long to get them to heal surgery and then prevent a reoccurrence of their problems. So I've spent the last 25 years talking about nutrition, believe it or not. And as it turns out, most of the advice I give patients in regards to uh, GI tract wellness is also the same advice one would want to hear if they're trying to take good care of themselves, maybe lower their blood sugar, maybe improve their blood pressure, perhaps they're trying to lose weight. And so we opened the med spa. Now, how does this apply to you people? I know I'm rambling. It applies. So normally when I talk to you guys, this is the kind of lecture I'm giving, right? So it's like, okay, if someone comes in with XYZ problem, um, what instrument is your surgeon likely to ask for? And then I will often give a little historical perspective on, you know, like, how did they invent that? What did they used to do back in the old days, et cetera, et cetera. Those lectures take an extraordinary amount of time for me to put together. And um, no offense, but I was just asked six days ago to give a lecture. Okay, so, so I didn't have enough time to kind of go fully through this. And of course, I didn't realize that when I had accepted. And so I start going through some old lectures and then I had an idea. Um, <laughs> lights bulb, uh, you know what? I am going to combine what I talk about with my patients, both on the surgical side and then also on the weight loss side. Um, and I'm gonna combine it into one lecture for you, the surgical technician. So I titled this, the care of the most important surgical equipment in the operating room. And the reality is the most important equipment in any hospital operating room floor, doesn't matter, are the human beings that, that work there, right? So what I have noticed, and I kind of gather y'all are feeling, because we all are, is in the coronavirus world, and that's like Voldemort. I think we should never use the word coronavirus ever again. It was so poorly managed on a national level, on a medical level, statewide, et cetera. I, I've lost almost all respect for most doctors nowadays. But anyway, I stress. You didn't hear me say that. I will deny it, even though I am recording this video. Um, but <laughs> please don't take away my license. Um, okay, so. But anyways, so the reality is that early on, it was hard for a surgeon like me who does what's considered elective 
Now, mind you, they were considering perforated diverticulitis elective surgery. They were considering early stage cancer elective surgery. They were considering cancer screening elective surgery. They were considering, I mean, literally you had to prove your patient was going to die within the next 24 hours that they didn't have an operation to get them on the schedule. And in that period of time, which was about not two weeks, that was three months. And the problem is in that three month period of time, people gave up. You couldn't even go see your doctor if you had a snivel. Like when was the last time a doctor said, you're sick, I won't see you. Like, well, what the hell is the purpose of having a doctor if they will not see you when you're sick? Um, I did start doing telemed. And if you've ever done telemed for butt complaints, that, <laughs> that is interesting. That is interesting. We did not record any of those conversations. <laughs> so, but I do have a HIPAA compliant little text thing. I'm like, if you go to the bathroom, you better never take it. So I've got all these ass pictures now on my computer. But I, well, what are you going to do? I, it was against the law. I got an, an edict from not just Greg Abbott, but from the Texas Medical Association, the medical director of our hospital, uh, which said I represented a threat to the public safety if I were to see patients in person in my office. And, and our profession used to go visit people with the plague. Um, and now I can't see you because your ass itches. I've been like, I don't even understand how that works. But so it was a travesty. But now that all of that is gone and we're all trying to repress those days, an angel got its wings, it's fantastic. Um, now that we're trying to repress all of that, it's still hard for me to get cases on the schedule. Why? Because there's no more nurses. You've burned everybody out with all the shenanigans, with all the nonsense. You've got turnover of techs and nurses. And, and so let's just mind you, everything that I do is about me, okay? Like, it sounds like I'm trying to help you. I'm really trying to help me. More importantly, I'm trying to help my patients. You guys have to take care of yourselves. I consider you guys the most important instrument in the operating room. And so today's lecture is going to be really very summarized. This is normally about eight hours worth of information. Um, and I'm congealing that into 30 or 40 minutes just as a little roadmap of what, what's that? You want me to keep talking for eight hours? Oh, I could do that. Snooze, snooze fast. But anyway, so, um, but. Now, some of you people may not be looking to quote unquote lose weight, but you are looking to feel better. You know, maybe you developed high blood pressure and diabetes in the last year. You can't get in to see your doctor. My primary care doctor will come at you like in a hazmat suit. You got to sit in the parking lot and wait for them. You got to text them when you get there. Then the hazmat unit has to come get you. Like it's the common cold. I'm perfectly healthy and my survival rate is 99.999% and the doctor is younger than me, which means I have, do not understand what all this is about. But anyway, so, so this is so you can do some self care because your doctor no longer cares about you, okay? I care about you. I want y'all to come to work so I can take care of my patients. Really, that's what it boils down to. Okay, so I put together this little video and I think I'm gonna have to manually, oh no, it looks like it wants to come up. I asked for you guys to send in some pictures and so I put a little montage. You guys have work. It's so exciting. With some disco music. Just ignore the music. It's... until I just played out loud, I thought, oh my God. 
I think I'll ignore that. <laughs> My daughter would be so critical of me for playing that little clip of music, but it didn't require a license, so I just accepted it. Okay. So anyway, so we're going to talk about self-care. Okay, so this is going to be sort of the hybrid of me, the surgeon, talking to you guys as if you were my patients coming in um, wanting to sort of take better care. Now, before you start any good habit, and I guess they say the average habit takes like 40 days to really set in, and it can take up to nine months for it to become automatic. Why is that important? It's important because there is actually no such thing as willpower. Okay, so that's been scientifically proven. There's no such thing as, as willpower. It, the more decisions you make in your lifetime, it, during your day, so like you're making decisions all day long, right down from what am I going to eat for breakfast and what am I going to wear? Those are decisions. As the day goes on, your decision-making capability gets worse and worse. And as it degrades, it goes to what the hell? It's like, I'm just going to take the easy answer, which is why most of us, if we're trying to be good and healthy are healthy until about four o'clock in the afternoon. And then it's like, oh, to hell, I mean, I'll just take that. Like you passed on that donut when it was fresh and yummy from Krispy Kreme, but at eight o'clock at night, all of a sudden it becomes like the, you know, the holy grail of, oh yeah, I think I'll eat that now. Um, why do we do that? And it's because you've made so many decisions through the course of the day. Now, if you're trying to get a good habit going, it is not automated in you. It's going to require decision making for about nine months. So for you to automate a good habit, and I'm, I'm here today to teach y'all some good habits, um, you've got to limit your decision makings throughout the day. You know this, if you're in the operating room, we do the same thing every friggin' time and the reason we do the same thing every freaking time is so no one is making any random decisions and the real reason we're doing that especially as surgeons is so that we're not running out of the energy to make a decision holy smokes when you have to make a decision right so if, if you've got and where's at I me mean, amy has known me for i don't even know how long and she was my first assistant god bless her soul and she's she's seen the shit okay literally Literally, you've actually seen the shit. Wow, yeah. Um, that's well, that was ironic. Okay, cool. Um, so anyway, but but I just same thing every single time. She has not. She's not been my assistant for five years, and I guarantee we can go do a case right now together, and uh, she wouldn't miss me because I haven't changed. Most surgeons are like that, and it's so when you're posed, poised here, and you know, you like you get propositioned with an oddity in the patient. An emergency, a weird complication. I can now make a decision with the with my best capabilities. Right? So I chose my specialty because I got to wear scrubs in the morning and I didn't have to choose my clothing. And that is a true fact. I knew I was going to be a surgeon my first day of medical school. I was like, I'm never choosing clothes ever again. And that's and, and I don't look at naked. So I had to wear something very easy. So it's because you don't want to make decisions. All right. I'm asking everyone to understand. If you are failing in learning a new habit, it's because you're making too many decisions in a day. It is not because you lack willpower. Willpower does not exist. That's the whole point of that slide. Okay, the other thing is, you're, and you, everyone's heard this, you are what you eat. The reality is you're also what you drink, what you hear, what you see, okay? Everything around you is what you become. And that is also true for personalities, which is a shame for you guys because you're hanging out with surgeons and we're all jerks. Okay, so um, they say the average person is like the summary of the five people they spend the most time with, right? That's kind of sad for you guys because you probably spend more time with jerks like me than you do with your own family. And so it's really important that you insulate yourself from negative influences simply because you you will become these negative influences so yes we're gonna talk about things that you should eat drink do etc to improve your personal health so that you can resist burnout but one of those things that you can do is turn off the news resist social media um limit sort of like aggressive things you hear on the radio whether it's podcasts or even music 
because all of those things are negatively impacting you. Okay, so that's like, that's important. So these are rules. I expect there's gonna be a quiz. Um, all right, and then finally in the rules section, there's three rules, I'll get things happen in three. Um, visualize your success. So before I went to medical school and before I went to graduate school, and y'all missed that part of the video because I got bored and turned it off. But um, I was a tennis player in college and then I became a professional tennis player and then I became a teaching professional. And one of the things along that course path of athleticism was to visualize what it is that you're trying to accomplish. It's called mental toughness training. And it's not a surprise that probably 95% of all CEOs of all companies, successful people all played a competitive sport at some point in their lifetime. And this is why. And so this is important for you, not just, you know, I'm gonna change my diet, but this is important for you. I'm gonna pay off my mortgage. You know, I wanna retire by the time I'm six. You've gotta have goals that you can personally visualize. There was a study that was done in the seventies where they took prisoners and it's not bad, okay, everyone don't get triggered by just saying that, okay. Where they wanted to test visualization when it came to sports, in particular sports, athletic sort of performance. And they took a group of guys out, 20 guys, 10 over here, 10 over there. Day one, they all shot free throws, 10 free throws. And they took a percentage, how many they got in the basket, okay. And they took one group and they stuck them out onto the little area where the basketball court is. And they got to practice for one hour a day. Shoot free throw. They physically got to practice the free throws. The other 10 guys had to sit in a quiet corner somewhere, close their eyes and just imagine themselves shooting a free throw and making it. At the end of the week, the guys who imagined shooting the free throws actually had a statistically better improvement in their performance than the guys that were out there just kind of shooting, right? So the power of the human mind is extremely important and it's not just true in what I'm going to cover today, but it is true for your life. I mean, most of listen to all of you guys, I mean, my God, we're under, you, you got CMEs that you need to do. Oh, holy smokes. And I, I got two months to do 30 CMEs. Okay. Well, that is a goal that you could visualize, right? Okay. Yeah. That means I'm going to get 15 this weekend and then I'm going to do this. That's two. And this is, and then you just make your little plan. Cause if you have a goal, all you have to do is visualize you achieving that goal and work your way backwards with the road. The road is never safe or never, it is, it is not ever safe. There's always some bastard trying to knock you off of it. But, um, but no matter, no matter how many obstacles you find, you just kind of weave your way around it because you got your eyes on the goal. That's what I want to say. Okay, and, and it applies to everything, not just the diet. So those are the three rules. Y'all got them? Okay, good. The, I am recording. All the dings and all of my swearing are all getting <laughs> recorded. And I will post it somewhere, I guess. I'll give it to Seth. He should get it distributed or whatever. Okay, so now, um, real quick on your own personal wellness. And this is important. Okay, so this, is, this lecture is about self-care of the surgical tech, really in the nurses and everybody else in the room, the doctors could stand, and I personally, and all the doctors could stand to learn some of this because none of us seem to take care of ourselves. I tell the, the people who come in to lose weight, I mean, now they're paying me for this uh, information. And the observation that I have made is that the average person can kind of juggle two or three things at the time, but in life, there's always more than two or three things. Right, so in my life, you know, there's my job and there's my husband and there's my children. And then like, you are always this like out here person, which is why you never take care of yourself, right? If you've noticed that you're taking care of everybody else before you get to yourself, which is kind of how you come into this position of, I'm kinda, I feel like I'm tired, I'm on edge all the time. You've gained 10 or 15 pounds because of COVID et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of that is because you are the ancillary thing and what you're juggling. And so being cognizant of that is really step one. Yes, you know, like an Alcoholics Anonymous course, <laughs> like step one, admit you have a problem. <laughs> and I do have a problem. For a long time, I always put surgery first. Why did I do that? What a waste of my life. I always put surgery first, um, which means my 
my husband and my children lamented, and then I never took care of myself. So, so that's wrong. You don't want to do that. Okay, it's family first. Um, honestly, it's you know you got to prioritize, which is right right over here. Prioritize your life is super duper important. The other reality that you have to understand is that the environment around you is they're trying to they are actually trying to poison you. By the way, if you knew how they grew food, how they, how they processed food, how they packaged it, and then how they advertised it to you, you would be hor horrified. You would be horrified. Even the stuff they say is organic. I don't know, it, you know, the definitions, right? Everyone's playing little words. And you, you need to be cognizant of all of those things and everything that you do, because you are what you consume, right? Like you may not realize that your aftershave lotion smells awesome because it has pheromones in it. Those pheromones are shutting down your testosterone. You want to know why we got a bunch of soy boys out there? You know, it's it's Axe spray. Okay, it's bad for you. It's bad for you. It's so bad. I have a 16 year old strapping young man as a son. He does not. He smells like terrible stuff. Cause well, like a goat. He smells like a wet goat. Because I will not let him wear this stuff. Cause you know he's growing, and and that stuff is terrible for you. So don't let your boys do the artificial stuff right that because all you know they want to be like the guys but you know old spice is a big one and axe don't want to do that i know they want to be men but men have testicles so they're going to have to stay away from the pheromone inducing things because it's contacting their skin it's getting into their bodies and it's dorking up their endocrine supply okay so that's that is happening to you on a daily basis which wash your clothes in the water you're drinking etc cetera, etc cetera. I don't mean to sound like a hippie because everyone will tell me Amy's the hippie, not me. I'm not a hippie. I don't believe I, I'm not a hippie, but I am telling you that is a real fact. Okay. Now, the second thing people need to understand is that in life, time management counts. The way you're going to be able to take care of yourself is managing your time. Y'all are used to managing time, time in the room, time out, time we cut, time we close, time we left, time to turn over. Time, I mean, like y'all are time and everything. And yet everyone in here is probably crappy at managing your own damn time at home, right? So, and it's, that is always the way that it is. Come to my house is a disaster. But when you see me operate, I got that shit locked down, okay? You know what I'm saying? So it's, you have to be cognizant at all times of, of your time. Now, when your brain is cloudy and when you're tired, you can't really think well and because you cannot think well, why? Because you've been making too many decisions throughout the day. So now you're gonna make bad decisions about your time management also. Um, and, and so what I suggest critical to this process is, is a detox. It's not a poopy detox. I don't believe in poopy detox. It's poopy detox, but it's bad for you. Don't do the poopy detox, but a dietary detox. And we'll talk about how one does that in just a moment. Um, and then once you've done that, your brain can think more clear you can manage your time a little bit better and you don't want to go backwards. So then the question is, what the hell is a clean diet? And how am I going to do that? Right. So we'll talk real brief. This is just a roadmap. We'll talk real briefly on that. When one works out and I, again, I was a professional athlete. I'm an avid working out sort of a person. However, if you don't have much time, then I'm going to advocate for weight resistance simply because not cardio be dams necessarily, but if you do interval training with weights, it takes very little time to get a good sort of regimen going to maintain your muscle mass, which is actually what drives your metabolism and gives you energy. It is your muscle mass that gives you energy. And so if you wanna have more energy in your life, you gotta be more muscular. And I'm not telling you to be like muscular. I'm just telling you, you gotta have some muscles. Okay, so, um, all right. And then you need to prioritize your life. This is. My big failing in life has been this priority thing. Because I always thought my profession, I work in a man's world. There's probably very few female surgeons that come through. I don't know, where's, have y'all had a lot of female surgeons come in here to talk or no? Yes, of course not, no. And the second I walk in the door, everyone assumes I'm a gynecologist. I'm not gonna say I'm offended. <laughs> I'm a surgeon. I'm a double board certified surgeon. Okay, and there's very few of us out there that happen to be female. I have always put my profession first. And I think that was an error in judgment. I probably would still be here giving this lecture had I put my family first um, or not, or maybe I'd be retired by now and who knows. Um, all right, so 
step one in, in my line of work is toxins kill and um, how does one detox, right? So this, these are the symptoms you get and you tell me if you have any of these symptoms, right? Food cravings and weight gain, yes. All right, fatigue or difficulty sleeping. Yes, yes. Um, reduced mental clarity, low libido. There's that ax spray again. Um, joint discomfort, belly upset. Like this is how a colorectal surgeon gets into wellness because I'm talking belly discomfort all day long. And as it turns out, it's the exact same steps to lose weight, fix your belly, same thing. Okay, so, and, and then like stuffy head, believe it or not like allergies and sinus congestions and all that, some of that is going to be related clearly to your environment. And these are toxic things. What's not on this list, unfortunately, it's not a longer talk, but Stephanie said just to ramble, so I will, um, is stress. Like stress is a four reels toxin. And it's a toxin in a couple of different ways, not just your adrenal glands and adrenal depletion, and sort of that axis between your adrenal glands and the hypothalamus and that sort of axis. Later in the talk, we're gonna talk about something called a microbiome, which is the bacterial content inside your GI tract. And, and that bacterial content reacts negatively to the hormones produced by stress as well. So you're actually getting a double stress response when you are stressed, which is again, Things that can stress you are a lack of time, right? And a lack of mental clarity. All these things stress you. So environmental stressors, as well as mental stressors, and, and honestly, food stressors, um, that, those are huge toxins. And that one is kind of harder to get rid of. You know, and I'm not here to talk about meditation or Zen. I'll come back some other time to talk about that. Okay, now you did think I was going to do a whole lecture and not have any more of these, but figures. So give away, give up sugar, right? So number one, if you're going to have a candy cane, it needs to be rectal. Okay. So, it, so <laughs> mainly because it's more entertaining that way. Um, but so you want to give up sugar. So the step number one, the step number one for detoxing your body is sugar. Okay. Um, I also include all the white starches because they're highly processed. So now I have taken away your sugar and your bread. That donut is no longer on the table, right? They're like, oh my God, no donut. What? So, so this is when, and when I, in my office, when people come in, because they got diverticulitis or their stomach is upset or whatever, I'll say, give up sugar and give up wheat. And those people leave my office like I had just murdered their puppy or something. Like, like what? <laughs> to which my response is Burger King. You can't have it your way. I mean, it's not my stomach that hurts, right? It's your stomach that hurts or it's your butt that hurts and it's not mine. So if you want to get better, well, this is the first step. All right, it's like an AA meeting, okay? First, you have to admit you have a problem. And I am a sugar holic, like, dude, give me one gummy bear and I will eat 10 pounds of it. I'd like, I'll eat that whole bag, don't give it to me. Once I start, oh my God. I, and my mother's a dentist. This is why I was ruined as a child. Um, now that also means a lot of people will consume sugar in their coke. So if you're going to have a, a coke, you got to have it rectally. I just joking. No, don't do that. Because well, I would like I don't take ER call anymore, so that would not be me taking care of this, right? So, but but anyway, I said you don't want to do cokes. No, no, you want to drink just water, and then people will ask how much water. You can actually drink too much water, and then you can also drink too little water. As a general rule, we tell people 64 ounces, the more accurate answer. If you're, yeah, drink it down, girl, drink it. Okay, so, but the more accurate answer, if you're detoxing, so let's say I'm like, okay, it's Lent, I'm, I'm Catholic, I'll be very Catholic in front of you, I don't mind. Um, it's Lent, I'm gonna give up something, fine, now's the time. I'm gonna do a detox. It's a perfect opportunity to get my mind right, right? So for you to detox properly, you have to be extremely well hydrated, okay? You could quit the sugar and you could stop the soft drinks and you could stop the wheat, but if you are not well hydrated, that's not gonna work, right? You gotta be well hydrated. And we suggest to people, they actually take their weight divided by two, and that's the number of ounces they need to drink in a given day. Now in our line of work, that is very hard to do, right? 
because none of us get breaks to use the restroom. I mean, how many kidney stones? Seriously. I never had a kidney stone in my life until I became a surgeon. And it's just because you're, you never drink. And then you drink all your water on your way home, which means you're up all my pee. Am I right? And then you throw in two children and holy smokes, right? <laughs> no good. So, so uh, the way I work around that, to be, I'll be honest with you, this is what I do. Are you ready? That's my answer to the water situation. The water sitch, as, I like, as my teenagers would say. Um, is I, in one of those early morning, I have to get up to pee situations. I will drink a 12 ounce bottle of water at that moment because that will kick in somewhere around six o'clock in the morning, which of course is before I'm scrubbed in. And then I can go my morning and then I'll drink another big glass of water, which will kick in right about the time I'm finished with my second case. And then on my way home, I drink a lot of water and that kicks in right before I go to bed. So, so it's basically try to time out four or five different bottles. And even if it means at two in the morning when you wake up to pee, I know it sounds crazy, drink more water. It's the only time you're gonna get this amount of water down the hatch, right? So you got time, you got time when you have to pee. I know that sounds crazy, but I time everything, time everything, all right? No, the other thing I didn't say, when you're trying to detox, you have to eat more protein. How is that not on the slide? I don't understand. It's because I only had six days to put it together. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so protein, you got to eat more protein. How much protein? Well, your lean body mass times 1.2 grams. It's going to be a lot, a lot more than you've been told. And I would say it's at least 100 grams of protein for probably everyone in here, if not close to 120. And you cannot really get that through normal food. You're probably going to have to do a little protein shake a couple of times a day. Um, for your protein, but you got to have protein because it takes chemical reactions to detox stuff in your body. It, you got to be hydrated because it takes kidneys to filter out all this stuff to get rid of it. That makes sense. So hydrate protein, get rid of your sugar. Okay, I think I beat that to death. Okay, cool. Um, managing time. I think I already kind of hit all this. I don't know. Yeah, okay, get goal setting. I already talked about it. It's like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So you gotta know what the elephant is and then just sort of start chiseling away at that. And that's how you start with your time management. Just know what's on the docket. I tend to live by a list. I have an ongoing, I used to write this down. I'm, I'm ADD if you haven't been able to tell. But, so I used to write a list and I would draw like a little square next to all of my little things, a little square. And then as I did them, I would check off the little square. And then if it was really important, I'd check off the square that I draw a line. So what I just did, I can't help myself. That's just the way I am. Now, it's not quite as satisfactory. But when I'm done with something on my list, I just erase it because I use my notebooks thing on my phone, you know, the little notepad. I type everything out. It says I'm done. It's gone. So I look at my little notepad multiple times per day. It's the number one thing that I look at. It's not Facebook. It's not the news. It's my little notepad. What's on there? Um, to make sure that I achieve everything it is that I have to get done so I don't forget something, okay? The other issue is organization. I think y'all saw that video. Y'all can organize like, have you ever seen a surgeon reach back to a scrub text table? <laughs> and then they come back with like a bloody stub. I'm like, oh my God, because, you know, <laughs> And that is organized back there. Don't you be all messing it up, okay? So like, I know, I've been slapped so many times. I've been slapped so many times. And the, the text that helped me will know there's the Anna pile that goes right here. And uh, you don't touch any of that other stuff, right? So you can touch this little pile right here and knock yourself out, but don't you touch all that stuff because it's organized. Okay, so you organize at work, you gotta organize your home. Your brain wants to see organization. And the other thing that makes it very easy, and there's nothing worse than if you had some, it's mostly, y'all are looking like my age or so. I'm sure everyone here has had, or is currently dealing with young children who will tell you at nine o'clock at night, I have a science project due tomorrow, right? It's my favorite. It's like, uh, okay. Yeah, mom, I'm gonna go ahead and need some poster paper. And like, they give you this list of stuff. And I'll be getting that from where? <laughs> like, oh my God. So it's your, because you're not organized, all of a sudden you're running around like a lunatic. It's, a, I used to bring my children. Okay, so in my life, 
until my kids were old enough to drive. And shockingly, they, they are old enough to drive. My daughter's off at college, but I mean, until they were old enough to drive, I brought them to school, right? And there's nothing worse than five o'clock in the morning. You can't find the other shoe. You can't find the sweater. You know, your son comes down in shorts when there's snow on the ground. What the hell? I said, right, so this is your day every morning. And what I am suggesting is don't let that happen. You're gonna organize your home. And every night before you go to bed, everybody lays the stuff out, including their lunch and their breakfast. And then you know in your mind what you're gonna have for dinner, right? So like that has to happen the day before, right? That way it's just automated. It's just like, do, do, do. And I said, you got it, right? You go. Um, and, and I will tell you, the male surgeons will never tell you this because they don't know this information. I, bastards don't know this information and I can remember I'd show up at work and it was like and I don't understand like you don't work until eight o'clock in the morning I was like because I won't tell you what I actually told them because it's a little vulgar but anyway but what it boils down to is that if I were a man then these things would happen magically for me but because I am not a man I am the magic little elf that does this, right? And it takes time. And there's no way I can get my children to school and get here to thank you. Now you can see why none of the male surgeons want to work with me. But anyway, so all right. But I am fun to hang out with. But anyway, so right, so that's okay. So it takes organization. And, and if you could get help in your with you, that is awesome because we do have a babysitter that takes we used to take care of them in the afternoons, pick them up from school because I can't do both. Um, and some of you are having to do both. Holy smokes, I don't even know how you're doing that, right? So there's got to be a way to organize your life to try to do that, incorporate friend groups and whatnot, work together in tandem as a unit so that you can share some of these responsibilities. Because that is honestly, child rearing is the single most important thing that you're going to do. And that's the most time consuming thing that you're going to do. And so you kind of have to put the kids first. So I totally get that. Um, all right, so, and you're gonna also wanna establish some routines and we talked a little bit about that. So that's what your brain wants to do. The other thing is batch your tasks. If you're shoving stuff in your hiney, make sure they're all the same item, right? <laughs> like, why would you do these nuts and bolts and then also a cup can? Like, you would never do that. That's so totally disorganized. There's totally different physiology involved, right? Totally different. It's totally, it's totally different. But honestly, so a lot of people will tell me that, Anna, you're just so good at multitasking. I am actually, no one is good at multitasking. You can't do that. Your brain can't go in 10 different directions. I am a batch tasking mofo though, I will tell you, because if there's things that are similar in their nature, boom, we're going to do them all at the same time. We're just going to do it. Stop what you're doing. If we're going to start talking emails, just knocking this stuff out right now and just get it done. I, I do the same thing when it comes to meal planning in the end. My husband's also a physician. So it's like we have these crazy lives and our children are growing up reasonably normal, shockingly. Um, but I think it's because there's dinner on the table when they come home. Why is there dinner on the table when they come home? Because I have a slow cooker. I mean, it's like, that's why. <laughs> so on Sundays, and I do love to cook, okay. And I, am I losing the guys in the room? I hope not. I don't mean to be too like estrogen -y, but anyway. So, but on Sundays, I like to cook. And so if I'm going to make Sunday dinner, I go ahead. If I'm chopping, I'm just going to chop a week's worth of veggies right now. My husband's over there with my son. They're watching the football. That's no problem. I like football too. I'm an athlete. I watch the football from over here and I'm chopping. And whoa, whoa, hey, Drew Brees. I can't, I can't watch Drew anymore because he's retired. But anyway, so, so, all right. So I do all that on a Sunday in Tupperware in the, in the refrigerator if I think I'm going to stir fry something. But if there's, my husband loves pot roast, thank God. And it's, he probably only loves pot roast because it's the only thing that I make. But anyway, um, <laughs> they have time to make. But anyway, you can actually cube up all the meat for the week for your different five, six meals, whatever the case may be. Put all of that in the veggies and Ziploc bags, throw it in the freezer. And then the night before, take one bag out of the freezer, put it in your refrigerator. And the morning of, while the children are running around like lunatics, bag open, slow cooker, add some water, whatever your little spices are in the house, turn on the slow cooker, boom, you're done, right? You've had to do nothing. You walk in the door of the house, 
smells like a home. I'm like, oh, who's smelling cooking? It's oh, what was you? Right? So, and so that's that's how straightforward it can truly be. Um, when I'm telling you what I'm about to tell you as far as the diet is concerned, you're thinking there's no way you can do it. And the answer is yes, there is. Because when you're cooking, when you're home and you're not at work and you decide you're going to sit down and you're going to cook dinner tonight, fine, cook seven dinners that night. Okay, you should keep chopping. You're all, I'm like you're chopping. Just keep chopping, girl. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I do. I don't have time to do it any other way. And so and it takes a little while, but honestly, I was able, the other day I did five meals worth of chopping. It took 20 minutes. Now I am good with a knife, by the way. Don't, don't break into my home. <laughs> I'm gonna stab you. Woo. I said, Stephanie, this is, okay, this is totally an aside, and I am dragging it out because Stephanie told me to, but um, she goes, make, make sure you guys can see me. All right, but anyway, so she goes, Anna, are you here? Like, yes, I am here. I'm in the bathroom. She goes, oh, I was told to stalk you. I was like, if you come in here dressed like a clown, I am going to stab you. Now, she laughed and noticed how she did not come into the bathroom because she knows I'll stab you. All right, now, clean diet. What is, what is a clean diet? Okay, a clean diet basically means that everything you consume from the time the seed was put into a normal ground to the time that you eat it, it really has not been exposed to any chemicals, but more importantly, it's been grown in soil that is rested from time to time. Now, I, I tend not to mix like religion and politics and so forth together, but it is quite biblical when they say you've got to let the land rest, you personally have to rest. These are important things because otherwise all the nutrients, everything that's important gets taken out of an object if you don't rest it, okay? The same is true for soil. You've got to rest the soil or everything that's important in that soil will not be there. And everything that's important is in that soil that is not there. To get something to grow, they have to add fertilizer to it. So it might look like a tomato. It contains about 1 60th the amount of nutrition that tomato had 20 years ago. Now, there's a reason we're all getting fatter, right? The reason we're all getting fatter is because we eat a meal that doesn't satisfy us. And we're looking for things that are gonna satisfy our hunger, which then we turn to processed food, which is all fat, to try to get that satisfaction sensation. If our food was grown in real soil, with real nutrients in it, my pot roast would be all you need. That is what I tell the children. My pot roast is all you need. Um, but it's because it has real nutrients in it. Now, <clears throat> having said that, that can be kind of pricey. And I get it. I'm very sensitive to that. Um, I think farmer's markets are really a good idea because you can get really grown things locally that are organic and at least you know who you're talking to or grow your own for some things that are easy to grow your own, get into canning, et cetera, et cetera. If you're in the store, do your best, just do your best. Get organic things, okay? Um, make sure that you're not genetically modified. Why? I'll tell you why. Um, because the reason I, okay, and I, I don't know if you meant you saw, I have a master's degree in microbiology and immunology. I was a biochemist for about a year, waiting to get into medical school. I was in a lab doing research and so forth and so on. I did a lot of PCR. I did a lot of genetic screen, screening and so forth. This was 25 years ago. 20, oh my God, no, uh, 30 years ago. Um, when the technology was all very new. And I used to think genetically modified was to feed the world. You know, you remember that we are the world stuff? Yeah, genetically modified is not to feed the world. Genetically modified is so that you can spray herbicides directly onto your food and it survives, right? That's why it's genetically modified. It's not so that it has more protein or you know the, the rice that has like beta carotene in it, it's just like vitamin A, it's for the poor people. Uh, no, it's so they can spray pesticides directly onto your food and then you consume it. And it's interesting because I, I do also have a farm and we don't use any fertilizer and we don't use any herbicides or pesticides or anything like that. Um, but if you talk to the local guys about the herbicides, they're like, listen, you spray the herbicides and within a day, it's out of the grass and you could feed your animals on it. Dude, that is not possible. These are organic molecules. 
And by organic, I don't mean like what the hippies mean by organic, like doesn't contain chemicals. I mean, it is a biochemical molecule that becomes part of the organism and a dead organism when you consume it, you're still consuming that object, right? So, so no GMO, no GMO. All right, don't tell Bill Gates I just said that because I'm sure that's not supposed to, verboten information. Uh, you also want grass fed. And I will tell you, uh, you can label some as I have grass fed cattle. You can raise grass fed cattle and then give them molasses and corn in the last three months to finish them out. And it still qualifies as grass fed, believe it or not, right? So even grass fed stuff does not necessarily mean it's grass fed. So you kind of, I mean, I'm just saying read labels. It's not easy to do, but if you can find a source, like do your research now, put all the work in now reading your labels. That way, when you go to the store, you don't have to think about it. It's like, I know this brand is okay. I know that brand is okay. I know I like that manufacturer, whatever. Does that make sense? In the chickens, oh my God, you don't want to see what they do to chickens. So you want free range chickens that are not trapped in their little bitty cages because they're under stress. You know why eggs are stressed animals? It's terrible. Okay, so free range. Now, I didn't know what to do with this slide because this cassette tape probably... <laughs> probably has toxic music on it. That's all I could think. So I don't know why you would put that. How? How would that go even in there? That's not even cylindrical. How did that get in there? I don't know. That's, I, it's, it's magic. I mean, I don't know how it goes in there. The question is when you pull it out and that strip comes out, do I have to take a pencil and like, <laughs> Give it back to the patient. Like, I, was this important to you? I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. But anyway, so long the short of it is, you want clean, you want your environment to be clean. And by clean, I don't mean antiseptic. And we'll talk about the dangers of making everything sterile. I hear you guys work in a sterile environment all day long, but surrounding yourself with sterility is actually bad for your health. And so you want order in your space, but you don't want sterility. Okay, make sure you're getting rid of toxic music, avoid the news media because all that crap is toxic. I don't care what you're listening to. Um, minimize the social media because all that stuff is fake. I'll be honest with you. You know, I like to go on Facebook every now and then to see how my high school friends are doing with their kids. Uh, and that's pretty much it. And then you got to turn it off because the stuff, that, I mean, the last two years, am I wrong? What, what has happened to the world? Anyway, so that's, that's what's going on the last two years. Okay. My first day of medical school, the first lecture that we had, there were a hundred of us and there were eight girls, right? So, and a hundred students. And the surgeon walks in the door and old man, he said, LSU. And he says, yeah, how many of you guys want to be surgeons? And like three people raised their hand. And I was one of them, I want to be a surgeon. Uh, I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Can you imagine me being an orthopedic surgeon? That would be terrible. Could you? Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. So, but wait, I, that's what I wanted to be. I was an athlete. And then in medical school, this is totally an aside, but in medical school in Louisiana, if you are female, you are not going to become an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> like that is just not going to happen. So what they did for us on our orthopedic rotations is they made us do the clinic. I never got to see an orthopedic surgery when I was in medical school, uh, much less allowed to apply for that residency. So it just, I, so I thought, well, general surgery it is. Um, and actually, then I was told I couldn't be a general surgeon. I had to be a gynecologist. Y'all stop. I don't want to be a damn gynecologist. <sighs> so I became a butt surgeon. So, okay, anyway. Um, all right, so, <laughs> that's a totally different story. Okay, anyway. All right, so anyway, so this guy gets up and he says, the most important thing for you to learn as a doctor. Oh, wait, actually, after we all break, the three or four people raise their hands. And I'm like, oh, well, that, well that's amazing. How are the rest of you gentlemen going to tell your family that you're not real doctors, right? So it was like, that was his, like, if you weren't a surgeon, you just were not a doctor, okay? So that is how I was trained. So no offense. Um, that means everyone you interact with, that's how they were trained. Um, anyway, so one of the things he said was very important uh, from Hippocrates. This quote is 4,000 years old and it is no manner of brains 
is worth a good set of valves. And that is so true. Now, a lot of what I do in my line of work is pelvic floor reconstruction. And I do a lot of diverticulitis and I do a lot of IBS stuff. And like, if your belly is dorked up, man, your brain is just, uh-uh. So that is a very, very important information. Okay, you've got to have a normal GI tract. Now, here comes the microbiologist in me. In your GI tract, and this is actually fascinating, was not present 30 years ago when I got my master's degree in 1990, this information was not on the docket, okay? Um, we didn't know any of this. We thought there were pathogens that are, yeah, there's a lot of bacteria, we don't know what they are, what the hell, uh, but there's pathogens. We know how to isolate the pathogens. And when your stomach is upset and, and all the pathogens, you're not growing any pathogens, we call that IBS. <laughs> is IBS is a basket term. It's not an actual diagnosis. So any of you guys have gone to a doctor and they're like, we don't know, I guess it's IBS, right? They don't know. So that's what they get the diagnosis from. Um, as it turns out, there's probably, if you've got ten, one, is it 10 trillion? There are 10 trillion human cells that put you together, which is amazing to me. But there is one quadrillion bacterial cells that coat your skin and line your intestinal and lung tract, right? So you are outnumbered 10 to 1 by microorganisms. So if we were to take all the DNA of your body and segregate what is bacterial and fungal and whatnot, and then what is you, like 1 to 2% of the DNA is actually you. The rest of it is all these other people, things. Right? So that's called the microbiome and human beings have a microbiome and all the animals have a microbiome and the plants that you eat, the animals that you are eating, all of them are coated in bacteria that you cannot sterilize and their GI tract is full of bacteria that you cannot sterilize. Y'all know you cannot sterilize human skin. You can't. You can antiseptize, you know, we add stuff, give it a couple hours, all the bacteria comes back. Y'all all know this. Okay, this is true with your fruits and vegetables as well. Right? So all of those things are coated in very important bacteria if it's grown in the proper soil and if it's not been attacked by antibiotics or pesticides, or herbicides, et cetera, okay? So this microbiome is important to you because it digests your food, gives you essential nutrients. It protects you from invasion from these pathogenic species that we do know about. But more importantly, those bacteria send hormonal signals to your brain to control your behavior. The reason you desire that donut is not because you don't have willpower. You desire that donut because last time you ate it, a particular type of bacteria in your GI tract was able to digest it properly. They multiplied and they sent signals of serotonin and dopamine up to your brain to say, that is what I want more of. That's why you want your donut right? You're being controlled by the bacteria in your GI tract. This is not a psychological failure on your behalf. Like, okay, so this is, okay, this is now AA meeting. I do have a sugar problem, but I'm not going to blame myself. I'm going to blame my microbiome. So how do I get rid of that sugar craving? It sucks a little bit because you have to detox yourself. You can't get rid of those bacteria. It's possible. But what you can do is you can keep those guys from growing so they don't ever send that signal to your brain. And you can make other guys grow, the ones that grew well when you ate your salad. When you eat a salad, there's a different population of bacteria that grow. And those guys want you to continue that habit. And so you, it'll send a signal. That signal is not as powerful as some of the other things you eat, which is why you're not addicted to romaine lettuce and you're addicted to the donut. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. All right. But if you go like a week or two without sugar, you'd be shocked how sweet lettuce tastes. And, and it's, a, it is an oddity. It's like someone put sugar in my lettuce and looks, I am, I am no sugar, but it's, these vegetables have carbohydrates in them. And I know you, you just can't even imagine that as a true fact, but it is. Um, how does one promote healthy bacteria? So I already said it. So you got to avoid certain things. This is why sugar is a toxin because bad bacteria that are bad for you can easily and readily metabolize sugar. And so when you eat something, the first thing that happens, it, the food you eat has to go through bazillions of bacteria before it gets to you proper. I mean, y'all realize that, right? Like you're feeding bacteria long before you're feeding yourself. 
And so the food that you eat, it's got to go through bacteria. Those bacteria chew up all whatever that is, break it down into little pieces and your body absorbs it. Okay, so if they break it down into pieces and your body absorbs whatever their byproduct is, that's what can make you feel bad. That's what gives you gas blow. That's what makes you feel upset. That's what gives you IBS. You're feeding the wrong bacteria. Now, what bacteria is it? I can't tell you the species. What I can tell you is eating sugar and processed foods makes that worse. And the most notorious is wheat, but milk will do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Hydrogenated fats are another thing. When bacteria digest hydrogenated fats, hydrogenated fats, they turn them into toxic fats. So when they get into your body, your body doesn't know what to do with them and stores them in the liver. I don't know if any of you guys do transplants. When I was doing my original board certification, now that was 25 years ago, um, the number one cause for liver failure requiring a transplant at that time was alcoholism, followed in very short order by hepatitis C. Um, and the answer to that now is fatty liver, right? How the hell in 20 years did we go from alcoholism, and there's plenty of alcoholics out there, getting outpaced by obesity that leads to transplant requirement? Like, think about what I just said, like you're being poisoned. This is why I am giving this lecture, because you may not know you're being poisoned, but you're totally being poisoned. Okay, and hydrogenated fats are on there, right? And that is going to be present in things that people are telling you are good for you, like vegetable oil, it's terrible for you. Olive oil, good for you. Coconut oil, good for you. Walnut oil, almond oil, those things are good for you. Uh, canola oil, the devil. <laughs> so say it right, it's really like that, right? But and but they put those help. Oh, it's vegetables. That's great. I'm gonna feed this to my family. It's vegetables. Uh, yeah, it's terrible for you um, because your body cannot. It's like eating plastic, except that plastic gets into your blood supply and lands right into your liver. And if your liver doesn't work, you will never lose weight no matter how you starve yourself, right? So no matter how you starve yourself, no matter how much you work out, that tire around your belly is only gonna get worse with time. And it's because you need liver health. And the only way to do that, get rid of sugar, get rid of the hydrogenated fats, and give it some time. Now the artificial sweeteners and antibiotics, these are bad because they just kill bacteria, right? So artificial sweeteners have an antimicrobial activity to them, which is why your dentist wants you all xylitol. Go eat some sugar-free gummy bears, a whole bag. You tell me what happens to you. <laughs> it's not good. It's not, my, my daughter found that out the hard way. Uh, don't do that. Yeah, it's bad for you, man. So antibiotics and artificial sweeteners kill bacteria. And if you kill bacteria, then again, the signals from your GI tract to your brain are not going to connect properly. Okay, finally, I think I'm almost finally. Sorry, am I? I see y'all circling. I'm hurrying, <laughs> but now hurry. I see. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like the signals I'm getting. That's fine. I, I got an audience now. Look, no, no, no. Hey, y'all whipped these people into a frenzy before I showed up. <laughs> they paid money. I'm just joking. I'll be done. Hydrogenated oils, and we have some out there. Just everyone simmer down. Simmer, simmer. I'm almost done. Simmer it. All right. So, I'm just joking. I'm almost done. All right. Anyway, so metabolism comes from your muscles. If you want more energy in your life, you've got to lift weights. Has to happen. And you should start with the big muscles first. So, okay. Yeah. Now, this is not what I'm talking about. Seems a lot right, right? No, come on, baby, why'd you do that? And the thing is what's so fascinating to me is that clearly anatomically, you've got the top barbell into the pelvic inlet, but the outside barbell not in the pelvic inlet. So I'm wondering, and you can tell it's a man, I'm just saying, you can see a shadow, there's a shadow. <laughs> Because women don't put stuff in their box. Let's just be honest. It's all, I've been doing this for a long time. I've never taken a woman to the operating room for a foreign rectal object, okay? <laughs> never. Men in the room, that ought to mean something to you. Okay? It's an hour out, baby, don't touch. Okay, so anyway, so you got this barbell, and I'm trying to imagine this guy at home. Once that thing popped in there, and he's like, oh no. Oh no, this, how did this plan go wrong? I've got a handle. I got a handle, it still won't work, oh shit. I'm just saying, 
So don't do that. When I say Kegels, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> We're gonna do that different. But <clears throat> excuse me. The best way to, to get a short workout in, like we're talking time management again, get your metabolism up, got to build the muscles. I've only got 15 minutes and I've only got a couple times a week. You can actually do it. So if you get a weight that you can lift at least six times, but not more than 12 times for women, for men, it's not more than eight times. That's the weight you start with. Okay. And then you hold that weight and you start from the big muscles working down to the small muscles. So you're going to do eight deadlifts and then eight squats and you don't take any breaks, eight squats and then eight rows, and then eight rows and then eight rows. it's like that, it's exhausting. Like, I mean, it only takes about 15 minutes. And if, and if you're stronger at one position than you are with the weight you're holding, just to have the weights out in front of you, but it does not take long to do that. And it's two or three times a week. We'll maintain muscles, focus on your hiney, take the stairs when you can. Okay. So like the Kardashian booty. Why is that pretty? That's all fat. You want muscle, baby. You want, right? You want athleticism. Look at some of these gymnasts on TV. They're nothing but muscle. That's fantastic. I love that. That's good. All right. Now, finally, prioritize. This is where I've gone wrong for so many. I'm 53. I was 54. This is, this is the problem that I have made for so many years is that I didn't prioritize properly. So I'm telling you right now, you start right now with my little students. There's only five of you in the room, whatever. Start now, okay? So uh, keep your faith, first of all. That's in, I'm not gonna mix religion and probably but the modern times, please keep your faith. Okay, number one, uh, spend time alone. And that's because you, you have got to have you time, right? So there's gotta be some time where you just decompress and no one is around you. Just don't do that while you're reading on the toilet because that's bad for hemorrhoids, okay? So, but you want, <laughs> But you do want to spend time by yourself, okay? Spend time with your family. Make your teenager. You, those teenagers turn into like recluse spiders. Um, they disappear. They come home from school. Spoop, they're gone. Uh, drag their little asses downstairs. We're going to have dinner. Um, and spend time with them. Ask them how their day was. Spend time with family. Don't sweat the small stuff. If someone at work just totally ticked you off, don't go home and ruminate over that for the next 24 hours. Because all you're doing is re-insulting yourself every single time you play that little track over and over again. You're causing too much stress. You're letting them injure you all day long. Don't know it. Just like, okay, whoo, okay, I'm, screw you. All right, so that's what you should say. Not to their face, you'll get fired. But I'm just saying, <laughs> right? And then know your worth. And so we're almost done, I promise. So know your worth. So, so and there's, there's an example that I like to give. There's a guy who sees, who inherits basically, his dad's old car. And um, he doesn't know what to do with it. It's, it well, I mean, it drives, but it's like a jalopy looking kind of thing. He doesn't know anything about cars. He takes it down to the junkyard. They're like, well, I don't know. The tires are shot, but it's got a carburetor and whatnot. So I, you know, I'll probably give you eight or $900 for the parts. And the guy would think, God, for dad's, I mean, this is his favorite car. I can't sell it for eight or 900. So he takes it to a used car dealer, drives it in, and the guy's like, oh my God, the amount of work that would have to be done, well, I could only give you probably four or 5,000 for it because, I mean, for me to sell it, I got to put a lot of work into it. It's fine. And then he goes home and he thinks and he realizes the car that he has is actually a, a Corvette from the 60s. And there's a local Corvette. Um, yeah, a little thingy going on, right? So the, the group, they're all adamant about their Corvettes. He brings the car to one of their little meetings. Everyone flips out about it, gets an offer for $50,000 and takes it and goes home, right? This is the same car, right? You've got three different audiences looking at the car. So what I am suggesting is not spending your life around people who think you're $800 worth of junk parts. But hang out with the people who like, hey, man, I totally like into everything that you're into and you're the $50,000, I cannot believe that car still runs for that, right? That is super important, okay? You are the sum gain of the five people you spend the most time with. And so hopefully that's your family and they're kind of thinking you're a cool old Corvette, right? Okay, so now y'all are exhausted, I see that. I named my son Matthew because it is the best book in the Bible. But um, for all of you who are burdened, 
right? We will give you rest. And I did ask the, the text to give me some pictures of themselves at work, so including sleeping text. So uh, now it's time for you guys to wake, to wake me, wakey. Um, anyway, so, okay. So now, okay, for most of what I have said is in a super easy to read five page book. I turned it into a PDF file. If you QR code that, put in your email, my little computer program sends you this PDF to basically give you the five steps that I just gave you without the playful banter and commentary, okay? And then if you have any questions about anything that I said, you can always email us back. Um, the email address will be mba at toker.world. And that just stands for um, mind body access, right? So a lot of us are in this mind body access and toker dot we're, well, you know, Dr. Toker. So anyway, okay. So if you want, I'm gonna leave that up there for a couple seconds. And I'm gonna record this whole uh, talk. I am recording it right now. And so it'll be at the very end of the recording you guys hopefully will get. All right. Does anyone have any questions? No, 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 no. Bobby is saying not a question. I will chop your hand off if you have a question. Can I ask one question? Anybody have a question? Because I am that thorough. That's what I'm talking about. All right, cool. All right. Now let's talk to you guys. And then I'm going to stop my recording, I guess. I don't know. I hope it's still recording. In the meantime.